Hi there, and welcome to the first episode in our PodCamp Media Virtual Open House series. I'm Dusty Weiss, president and founder of PodCamp Media, a podcast production company for brands and associations that want to use podcasting for their business. And having worked virtually for more than two years, we recently opened the doors to our brand new podcast studio in beautiful downtown Milwaukee. We're going to be using this series to introduce you to some of the key players in the local business ecosystem. And so we are delighted today to be joined by two Milwaukeeans who are making an impact daily in the city. First up is Milwaukee Common Council President and candidate for mayor, Alderman Chevy Johnson. Alderman Johnson, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Dusty. I'm glad to be here. It's beautiful in here. Yeah, thank you. We're also joined by Matt Dorner, the Economic Development Director at Milwaukee Downtown. Matt, thank you. Thank you for having me as well. And yes, thank you for investing in downtown and opening this beautiful studio. Well, and Mm -hmm. similarly, we're going to talk a little bit about what you guys are doing to support small businesses like mine in just a little bit here. But gentlemen, I did want to speak with each of you today for this series because there is so much exciting stuff happening in Milwaukee right now, particularly the downtown, but in the neighborhoods too. And it's a big part of the reason that I wanted to locate my business here. I had a a buddy who uh, uh, jumped on me on LinkedIn the other week. In fact, he said, what are you opening a business in Milwaukee for when you could get so much cheaper, blah, 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 out in the suburbs? And I'm like, no, no, you really Mm -hmm. don't. Um, There's just a lot more value to be found in the city. And and this is where all the action is right now. And even the last year and a half of COVID Mm -hmm. hasn't been able to stop the momentum entirely. So Chevy, we'll start with you. What's got you the most excited about Milwaukee's economic future right now? Well, uh, that, that's a, a great question, and I totally agree with you that there's a lot happening in the city of Milwaukee. And if folks are looking to start businesses or grow businesses, then they ought to consider doing that in the city of Milwaukee proper, like you did. So thank you for being here. Um, you know, when I look at what's happening in Milwaukee, j- across the board, across the spectrum, not just downtown, but in the neighborhoods as well, there's a lot of exciting things happening. I was just, uh, before coming here, uh, over at the Northwestern Mutual uh, campus over there and got to go on the... They've got the, a little bit nicer facility than we have here. <laughs> <laughs> Podcast media, right? I'm not going to say that. I'm just, <laughs> uh, but but it is very nice. And when you go on the top floor and you get to see that expansive view of the city and you see all the buzz, you see all the activity, you see why people are choosing Milwaukee and why they're choosing our neighborhoods and why they're choosing downtown. Um, so as I look around, I mean, you got the the the... the uh, the Avenue that's getting ready to come online uh, next month. You've got uh, Milwaukee Tool that is just reshaping their building that they're going to uh, downtown out in the neighborhoods. You've got Taste of Lindsay Heights that opened uh, over in that neighborhood not terribly long ago. Back down here, you've got the Couture that's under construction downtown. Um, you've got everything that's happening over at the Deer District, including the hotel, the trade that broke ground mm-hmm. just recently. You've got activity uh, going on on the south side of the city. I was just a couple of a couple of weeks ago at uh, uh, Fiesta Selena uh, down in the Garden District that was just buzzing with activity. So there's a lot of exciting things happening in Milwaukee, and I'm, I couldn't be prouder of where the city is and where the city's going uh, economically in the future. Right. Yeah. And Matt, we certainly see this economic growth manifested most obviously in downtown Milwaukee. Um, the projects are just more in your face down here. And, and you've been and you've been with Milwaukee downtown for more than seven years now. How have you seen this part of town change just in your short tenure here already? Yeah, it's been um, an incredible run for downtown Milwaukee. Absolutely. Um, even if we back up a few more years kind of looking back of coming out of the great recession going back to that 2010 era it's really been one of the most robust growth periods in the greater downtown area um over the course of that time frame we've just seen incredible nodes of activity as um council president johnson had mentioned if you're in that um, lakefront zone of the central business district just looking back and i could see the view from my apartment now you do have the northwestern mutual commons the largest office building complex in the in the state of wisconsin you have um, the 833 um, multi-tenant development which was the first office multi-tenant office building built in downtown milwaukee in over a decade at that point uh, new hotel brands like the weston hotel and the kimpton down in the historic third ward coming online and the couture coming out of, out of the ground. So if we think geographically, there's just some incredible nodes of activity. If we look at the reinvention of West Wisconsin Avenue, 
we have moved our offices over to the avenue, the former shops of Grand Avenue, getting really excited to welcome the Third Street Market Hall within the coming weeks here. Omar Sheikh's new project. Uh, 100%, one. yep. absolutely. Looking forward to supporting that. Um, across the street, Milwaukee Symphony Orchestra um, coming online right there as well. Uh, the convention center um, expansion coming on coming um, out of the ground as well. Head just north a few blocks. You have the whole Deer District and Pfizer Forum. So just an incredible amount of nodes of activity that have just resulted in um, you know, some thousands of new residential units coming out of the ground as well. Um, new office, new hotel brands, and a lot of exciting work um, that we're working on in particular and some of those third spaces and public spaces underneath the freeway, whether it be public art or lighting, um, and just helping re um, build those neighborhood connections uh, that were sort of broken by freeway construction years and years ago. So how do we look at that with our peer organizations on sort of leveraging all the private investment that's taking place and then ultimately looking at some of those third spaces and really making downtown as walkable as it can, linking together all those nodes of activity. Um, also, just a couple other, I mean, on the transportation front, obviously the Hop Streetcar coming online just a few years ago and its hopeful expansion in the near term. Um, some some incredible projects really have taken place over the last several years. You know, the streetcar is a neat one uh, and, and particularly <laughs> close to us here at PodCamp Media because it runs right past our front door. It and does. when we have somebody come in who's the CEO of the National Corn Growers Association or uh, uh, high up represent, uh, mm -hmm. high up marketing representative from our clients at Nutrient Ag Solutions, as a, for instance, uh, they're going to want to get out and see downtown Milwaukee when they come to visit us here. And having that streetcar to sort of help them tool around and, and see the downtown is a, an incredible asset and an opportunity and definitely one of the reasons that we look to put our headquarters down here as well. Um, but you both alluded to uh, Northwestern Mutual and the Deer District. The Deer District, of course, the new home of the Milwaukee Bucks down here. And one thing that I think is really striking about development in Milwaukee over the last 10 years is not just that it's happening, but who is getting to play a role in it happening. And I mentioned Northwestern Mutual and the Deer District because both of those projects had a local resident hiring preference requirement uh, that was not just met, but exceeded. Um, Alderman Johnson, uh, you and your colleagues on the Milwaukee Common Council played a big role in making that happen. A lot of developers said it couldn't be done. Uh, what does it mean to you to see those hiring goals met and exceeded the way that they have been? It it means the world. You know, um, as I look at what's happened in Milwaukee over the course of the past number of years, right, uh, especially in our, some of our neighborhoods um, where there's a lack of uh, opportunities for people to have family supporting jobs, having that RPP or residence preference program opens the door for individuals who are unemployed or underemployed in the city to have a new access point to uh, getting family sustaining work. So it's not just Pfizer, which I think, you know, it has been great and other developments that, that likely will come in the Deer District that have benefited um, or even um, Northwestern Mutual. I mean, you look at the Couture, right? I mean, that that's going to be a million hours of a million construction hours. And because of the residence preference program, 40,000 uh, or 400,000 rather uh, of those hours are going to go to people who live in Milwaukee's neighborhoods who are unemployed or underemployed. You know, that presents an opportunity for those folks to get linked up with job opportunities uh, right here in the city that are accessible, uh, that are family supporting and could put them on a trajectory where they have stability in their lives and stability in the lives of their children so that they can purchase their own home and create stability in their in their in their family and in their neighborhoods. That if we have enough of that, that multiplier effect, then that's how you create neighborhood stability. Right. So it's, it's not simply just policing. Um, it's also providing economic opportunities for folks too. And that's what things like a residence, residence preference program allows to happen in Milwaukee. What about you, Matt, from your perspective, that notion of having the people that live in Milwaukee's neighborhoods work on the development projects that have made this such a rich and interesting place to live and do business. Um, when you look at it from your perspective, are you seeing this new influx of interest in Milwaukee's downtown, not just from, you know, people and, the, and business interests, but residents of Milwaukee as well. 
Yeah, absolutely. We've always talked about, and our mantra has been that downtown is a neighborhood and a neighborhood for everybody. So everybody across the city, Milwaukee and beyond, um, is welcome in downtown. So we continue to, you know, the programming, the activities that we're involved in, it's all about attracting um, folks from all across the city. So yeah, um, and there's also, um, to that point, um, just as we look over the last several years, there's a lot of additional interest from outside investors. Historically, Milwaukee's had a lot of local investors that have been either building owners or, or business owners, and now just outside the marketplace, looking at Milwaukee as a place that they want to invest. So it really is full circle, not only with building a downtown that's inclusive and welcoming everybody, but also just even that outside investment money, looking at downtown to to, to get involved because they, they're they very bullish on Milwaukee. So it, it's great across the entire spectrum. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you, I had a really neat experience um, a couple of years ago when they were building the Pfizer Forum for, uh, uh, I got a chance to walk through the construction site with Alex Lazry, the senior VP <laughs> at the, the Milwaukee Bucks. And um, he introduced me to a couple of the folks that were working on the site through the residence preference program, people that had been upskilled and given these opportunities to have these family supporting jobs. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll never forget it. One guy, he uh, was telling me about it. I just asked him, what does it mean to you to be able to work on this? And he said, man, I can't wait to take my kids downtown someday and point at this building and say your dad built that and then we're going to oh, yeah. go see a basketball game in the house that his dad built and that just for me to see someone feel so empowered and so proud of the work that he was doing it it stuck with me but i'll say this too if we rewind back to march april of 2020 all this momentum milwaukee being in the national spotlight with the democratic convention coming to town and all that all that suddenly was jeopardized by the onset of the COVID pandemic. And I don't know how you guys felt at the time, but I looked at that and I said, oh, we just can't have nice things in Milwaukee. <laughs> we never get to have nice things. And it was, the pandemic was sort of a wet blanket on, uh, on the development happening here. But as we're hopefully beginning to emerge from COVID's shadow a little bit, uh, Alderman Johnson, what is the city doing to kind of re-kickstart that momentum so that we can pick up where we left off? Yeah, absolutely. And yes, COVID was a wet blanket. I think everybody can agree to that. I mean, when you look at the the Democratic National Convention, uh, we were expecting, you know, all these people to come here to descend upon Milwaukee and have an economic impact uh, in our city and our region of over $200 million. And that just was not to be, uh, not in 2020, but... Uh, in typical Milwaukee fashion, uh, we dusted ourselves off. We fought through the challenge. We said, okay, we're looking at 2024 um, and we're going to try it again um, in terms of, you know, you know, making sure that our city is in a position to host a, a national political convention. And so, you know, now the Democrats are looking at Milwaukee. Uh, the Republican uh, National Committee is also looking at Milwaukee for a convention as well. In the meantime, we've added hotels uh, in downtown and throughout mm -hmm. the region as well. Uh, to better position ourselves to be able to take on uh, to take on the convention, and you know the city has been integral in that process. Right since COVID started, we've been working to make sure that we uh, provide resources, uh, whether it's CARES Act dollars or others, to make sure that uh, businesses operating in the city have access to the finances, the the financial resources in order to bounce back from COVID. Now, um, so whether it's you know things like uh, protective equipment, uh, these PPE supplies, we're working to do that, whether it's uh, working to make sure that they have uh, funding to, to pay their employees who perhaps have been on leave or need a, an extension, uh, we're working to do that as well. Um, our Department of City Development has been in touch uh, with our business partners on the ground. Uh, and so the city has really, really been involved um, in order to help businesses to overcome uh, the, the, the damaging effects that COVID has had in our in our economy locally and i'm proud of the, what the city's done i mean because of that i mean we're we're continuing to see economic activity happen all over the city i mean i mentioned you know just recently um to you some of the things that we've, we've seen over the, over the course of the past couple of weeks taste of lindsay heights opening um the, even with some of the problems we've had over the years at century city uh the, the first building filled and now you know looking at opening another one you know coming up uh, pretty soon here uh, on the far northwest side, you know, looking at um, the the Granville connection, you know, possibly you know, open in the near future, and then all the stuff that's happening, you know, in Bronzeville, 
uh, that's been, you know, a hop, skip, and a jump away from the Deer District, but a lot of things are happening over there. Bronzeville Collective, so many other things on the near south side, a lot of stuff going on on Mitchell Street and some of the other bids down there. Like, there's a lot of great things happening, and the city's been really engaged in a part of that process. Yeah, certainly. And, you know, we're not exactly a corporate powerhouse here at Podcamp Media, but we are a growing small business. And, Matt, you had a role that you got to play in helping us expand our footprint by supporting our bid for a Wisconsin bounce back grant uh, funded by the American Rescue Plan Act and administered by the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. And I won't lie, that little infusion of support really helped pad the blow of opening our first corporate footprint here in downtown Milwaukee. So thank you for that, first and foremost. But what are some of the other tools in the toolkit for businesses that want to grow right now in the wake of COVID? Yeah, absolutely. And um, thank you for that, Dusty. We're happy to be here to help. And that's one thing to, during the, the pandemic where, you know, the, the Business Improvement District uh, ourselves, we really sort of doubled down and, and, and looked at what are all those sort of programs that are out there and how can we be a clearinghouse for our small businesses when, you know, at that you know early stages of the pandemic, you know, there's just a lot of questions about what does the future hold? So, you know, we quickly um, pivoted, brought together a variety of programs. And again, if they're coming down from federal stimulus or state or even local, and thank you, uh, um, um, Chevy for the city's role in putting together several programs that were really integral for our small businesses. Um, and then again, you know, we were making sure to communicate those out far and wide, citywide, um, to to get those dollars into the small business that needed them. Um, in our role, pre-pandemic or and post-pandemic, you know, we I commonly am working with small businesses that are looking to leverage some of the city programs like those facade, facade grant dollars, those white box dollars, those um, re, uh, retail investment fund dollars, signage grants, et cetera, et cetera. So we become, you know, sort of, how do we help some of these small businesses piece together those programs? Um, also in my role um, early with starting with the bid, I forged a relationship with Bank 59. We developed a low interest loan pool with them, 1% money on loans up to $25,000. Um, so again, we have that sort of specific for downtown tool, but those are that's just a sampling of some of those that are available for small businesses looking to grow and expand in downtown Milwaukee. Mm-hmm. So we got three guys <laughs> sitting at the table right now. Obviously we're all very bullish on Milwaukee, mm-hmm. but there's an elephant in the room, so to speak. And if I was making a list, Chevy, of the hurdles that the city of Milwaukee has to overcome right now, number one is obviously COVID, but number two is our own state government, it feels like sometime. And in spite of the, in spite of the fact that Milwaukee is one of Wisconsin's top economic powerhouses and contributes more in taxes than it gets back, it seems like our state legislature is kind of sometimes trying to stick its thumb in our eyes here in Milwaukee. Why is that? And what can we as Milwaukee boosters and you in particular as a member of the Common Council and soon to be mayor, uh, what can you do about that? Yeah, well, that's a great that's a great question. And you're right. Um, Unfortunately, uh, the state government uh, has been somewhat of an impediment uh, to Milwaukee, uh, especially as it relates to. Um, our ability to raise revenue to solve the problems that we have here on the ground uh, at the local level. Um, and there are a whole host of historical reasons that I don't know if I necessarily need to relitigate here, but I'm looking forward um, about you know what we can do you know, in the future um, with me in position as mayor, especially. Um, and I think that since I became president of the council, and I'll certainly continue to do this as mayor, is work to build new relationships with the legislators in Madison, right? I understand that, you know, we're not going to be able to move big things forward, get the big things done for Milwaukee that we need to, unless we have better working relationships with the legislature. And so I've said, uh, as a, a candidate for mayor, certainly you know, it, as I uh, assume the mayorship, that I'll have what basically amounts to a, a cot in the Capitol. You know, and and I went to UW Madison, so I know that road very well. And so it's nothing nothing for me to to, to be there. Um, so I'll be working uh, on a daily basis to be an advocate and a champion for Milwaukee and building relationships with Madison in order to accomplish the ends for Milwaukee. Um, our revenues do need to change. I mean, they're, they're just untenable. Like, if you look at our shared revenue structure right now, we're receiving about $111 million less than what we did back in 2003. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, wow. I mean, it, it is laughable. It, it, it really is. Um, so we're receiving those fewer dollars, yet our police costs have skyrocketed $115 million. Mm-hmm. There's no way that that's sustainable. 
And so if you're not giving us enough money back in shared revenue, then you need to open up other ways, other avenues for us to be able to to uh, bring those revenues in to pay for local costs that we have here. I mean, if you go to any major city across the country and you buy X product, right, there's going to be a local sales tax that that municipality was able to generate to capture, you know, dollars that you're spending as a visitor. We don't have that tool in Milwaukee. We're, I think we're like the last major American city that doesn't have the tool. And not that we never had it. It's that it was actually taken away by the state legislature. They passed legislation that said Milwaukee cannot raise taxes. Yeah. So, so we, so we desperately need the legislature to see the competitive disadvantage that they're putting Milwaukee at nationally. And then also the, the, uh, the position they're putting the city in financially, locally. Like, I I don't have. I'm a guy that I look. I just want to pay the bills. <laughs> you ask my wife, like, you know, uh, I I even though you know we do it every month. I know what they are. I scour over the bills every month to make sure that everything is paid and that there's a credit, right? And I would endeavor to do the same thing at the city. I want to pay the bills, but I understand that in order to get the money to do that, the legislature has to be my partner. And if, you know, one of their principal priorities is being fiscally responsible, then help me to do it. Help the city to do it, right? Um, because as you mentioned, Milwaukee is the economic engine of the state. And the better Milwaukee does, the better the state of Wisconsin will do mm-hmm. too. So it's in our interest, yes, but it's certainly in the state's interest too to make sure that Milwaukee is doing well. And that's exactly what I'll be fighting for as mayor. And I think it starts with reframing the conversation from Milwaukee versus Wisconsin to Milwaukee and Wisconsin Correct. together, going to the same place, whether that's good or bad. Yeah, and yeah. and I think I think it's one of the biggest jobs that you will face uh, when you take over as. Uh, acting mayor, and and as we mentioned, um, you're running for mayor then as well. But uh, the situation, for those who aren't familiar, is that uh, Mayor Tom Barrett has been appointed by President Joe Biden to be the ambassador to the Grand Duchy of Lux- Luxembourg. Uh, easy for me to say. Um, and so when or if he's confirmed by the Senate, then you as the Common Council President would take over as acting mayor and you'll be running for the position on a permanent basis as well. So what would you say then, Chevy, does Milwaukee's next mayor need to be successful against all of these new challenges and opportunities that the city faces? Yeah, well, yeah, that, that's a great question as well. Look, I, I think that certainly uh, a better working relationship with the state is paramount. That needs to happen. Um, you know, Mayor John Norquist used to say, you can't build a city on pity, though, right? Uh, he was you know, kind of famous for saying that. And I believe him. I, I think that's true. And so I'm not looking for pity to build the city. I'm looking to build the city off of a strong foundation of safety. Right. And so when I look out in the city right now, you know, there's this scourge of reckless driving that are that's causing people to be afraid to traverse the streets in their own neighborhood. You, know, you to, to take your kid or your grandkid out on a walk around the block. Um, to go to the grocery store, to drop your your your, your kid, your son, your daughter uh, off to school, to get your prescription drugs, uh, because folks are behind the wheel and they're not uh, doing things on accident. They're purposefully uh, causing a public safety concern. It's by like dri- GTA up by, in there. Yeah, sometimes. yeah, yeah. Right. By 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 driving recklessly, and we've and we've got the the accidents and the and unfortunately the dead bodies to prove it. Right. So that's an issue. Um, in addition to public safety, I mean, you've got you know issues around where you know you turn on the the news you know at ten o'clock every night like I do, and day in and day out there's somebody who's been shot, non fatally or fatally in this city. Um, you know that's unacceptable to me, and I think it's unacceptable to the vast majority of the people who live in this city. And those are things we have to get under control, um, not just with police, although police certainly are part of that solution. Um, but it's not just enforcement. There has to be education on the front end. And there has to, has to be violence prevention in the middle as well. And then you have the enforcement piece, too. So we have to really get a grasp on public safety. And I talked about, you know, improving the relationship with the state, which I think is critically important and not to be understated. Uh, but the other area here uh, that I think in our, that we need to uh, make stronger in order to build a city is uh, economic opportunity. If you get safety and education, you get 
and economic opportunity and you mesh those together, you have a firm foundation on which to build a society. And for too often, it seems like in Milwaukee, we have been waiting. We've been waiting and waiting and waiting for 40 years to turn the clock back to make sure that there's heavy manufacturing jobs available um, in this city like there once were. It hasn't happened for decades. It's not going to. And so we can't rely on this silver bullet approach to jobs. We need to look at a, a true 21st century jobs program in Milwaukee. And there are opportunities available. When we talked about some of the stuff happening downtown right now, you look at the couture even. I hate to keep pointing back to it, but um, but it's it's such a prime example, right? There are opportunities right now, again, for people who are unemployed or underemployed to get laced up with uh, employment and apprenticeships and trades, you know, um, at, at a place like that. We talked about Milwaukee Tool. They're going to be bringing up to 2,000 jobs, making $75,000 a year right downtown to Milwaukee, right? On, on apprenticeships and trades, again, I, I often tell this story about this, this, this young man who graduated from uh, a high school in Racine, 17 years old, signed up for an apprenticeship, making 20 bucks an hour. I wasn't making 20 bucks no, an hour no, at 17, <laughs> right? And then in four years after he completes the program, he'll be making $67 an hour. That's more than I make now as council president. And it's certainly more than I'll make as mayor <laughs> uh, as well. But if we can get more people, like if we can get more of those opportunities in front of more people in this city, that transforms things. And again, when folks have the economic opportunity and their own life is stable, then that means their kids' lives are stable. That means they're purchasing their home. And so our neighborhoods are stable and not transient. They're not porous as they are now. That bleeds out into schools and that bleeds out into society overall. That's how you get there. And those are the things I want to work on as mayor, uh, amongst other things. But improving the relationship with Madison, uh, getting our public safety situation uh, corrected um, and working to make sure that people have access to a true family supporting job in Milwaukee. Those are the, 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 the tent poles of the campaign that I'm running. And I think. I'm confident that we'll be able to accomplish those things uh, over the course of the next several years. Well, and from what you've told me so far, it, it sounds like the campaign is off to a really promising, really aggressive start. And uh, I know that there were a lot of people kind of standing around in the wings saying, do you think Chevy's going to run? Do you think Chevy's going to run? <laughs> and so when you announced, I think that there were a lot of people that got really excited about it. I think that uh, it's a breath of fresh air and uh, has the opportunity to be a really uh, transformative uh, uh, candidacy as well. And so uh, we wish you the best of luck going forward with that and, and look forward to seeing how it all shakes out here. Um, but uh, in the meantime, Matt, I did want to come back uh, to your position in Milwaukee here as well, because most people know where downtown Milwaukee is, mm -hmm. but they're maybe less familiar with downtown Milwaukee bid number 21. That's business improvement district is what bid stands for. So what does bid 21 do? How is its impact felt by visitors, workers, and residents downtown. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, as you mentioned, um, Milwaukee downtown is one of the city's dozens of business improvement districts, and we generally cater our geo we have a geographic boundary that generally covers the greater downtown area. 25 years ago, we were founded on the fundamental basis of building a clean, safe, and friendly and economically viable downtown. Um, and that really was initially founded in you'll see our clean, our, our clean sweep ambassadors on the street, literally um, sweeping with our powers. Uh, the blue jackets, absolutely. the blue jackets. Yes. They're out there, they're cleaning things up and they're I high cleaning. five them whenever I see them because I'm so <laughs> glad to have them yeah, there. Absolutely, our public service ambassadors, our, walk, our walking mm -hmm. concierge that you'll see on the street. Um, landscaping, we have landscaping crews and we maintain hundreds of planter beds up and down Wisconsin Avenue and the Riverwalk and in several of our nighttime um, districts. Um, a lot of people recognize us for our signature events. So we are the ones that are behind Downtown Dining Week, um, Downtown Employee Appreciation Week, Taste and Toast is one of our newer iterations of a wintertime Downtown Dining Week. And then what's going to be coming up most uh, in, in the near future here is, is the Holiday Lights Festival. So th those are some of our signature events that everyone really recognizes um, the organization for. And then as we continue to um, have evolved over the last uh, number of years, the bid's been much more um, involved in um, the public realm. If you've seen a mural that's went up in the, do the greater downtown area over the course of the last several years, it's likely Milwaukee downtown and our project partners had some role in getting that done. We've um, been involved in several smaller public space improvement um, programs. Um, 
and really the greater the the greater marketing of downtown to not only our downtown constituency but the the region um, the region as well. So um, we put together annual marketing campaigns that we hit across all different mediums. In my role with the business improvement district, it really does come down to. Um, business recruitment, business retention, working really closely with the development community, the commercial brokerage community, the small business community, uh, maintaining that go-to market data or leading, helping lead on tours and a variety of those quality of life initiatives and really telling the story about why downtown is the place that you want to do business. What are those competitive advantages and why, and this is why you should be located in downtown. So all of those things sort of packaged up. It's a very comprehensive program that we hope is touched by residents, workers, visitors alike, and, and really makes them fall in love with the city. Well, and certainly I'm a big fan of downtown dining, dining week and, and <laughs> always look forward to that one rolling around. Great excuse to get out of the house, but 100%. Uh, it's uh, great to have you here and, and everything that you guys are both doing for the city here. Um, was there anything that you guys wanted to touch on that we haven't got to yet or anything that you wanted to ask me? Yeah, I, I, I think that, uh, I, so I, I asked this question, um, you know, off air, but I'll ask it on air, uh, about the, about the, the name of, uh, of your, your, your business here, Dusty. Um, cause I, I am looking at it and I'm seeing a, a campfire and I know for me, uh, going to camp, um, with the YMCA when I was a, a teenager was this transformative time in my life. So why don't you tell me a little bit more about uh, the name? PodCamp Media comes from what I think is one of the richest storytelling heritages of any region in our country, because I think that uh, Midwesterners in particular, uh, we put a lot of stock in stories and, and whether it's telling the old stories of, uh, of, of how you met your spouse or, uh, telling old tales about when you were in high school, running around, getting into trouble with your buddies, storytelling is more a part of who we are in the Midwest, uh, than I think it is anywhere else. And so, PodCamp for me calls back to what was the heart of my experience and really growth as a, a storyteller uh, growing up, um, which is Wisconsin's uh, Wisconsin's heritage um, in storytelling, uh, of telling stories at YMCA camp, uh, of uh, Boy Scout camp, telling the stories around the campfire there of uh, going to fish camp and, and telling the, the fish stories from last year about the great big old four foot northern that got away from you. <laughs> it, uh, it, it really ties into that heritage that we have here of telling great stories. And uh, plus it's, as I told you, it's a terrible pun on podcasts <laughs> and I love terrible puns. And so really I just, I wanted to take that storytelling heritage and, and channel it into something uh, channel it into a spirit that our clients can can kind of catch the buzz and, and get on board with telling their story through podcasts uh, to their constituents, to their customers, to their members, um, and anybody else that they want to engage with that rich storytelling heritage. So that's that's really what we try to do here. It's uh, it's all about the story at the end of the day, as one of my favorite journalism school professors like to say. Well, uh, as you're somebody that loves a, a good pun, I'll tell you, I know that, uh, you know, your son is is a little young yet. Mine is eleven, and so uh, as he gets older, because uh, I enjoy a good pun too, because I'm a dad, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, it comes with the territory. <laughs> it comes with the territory. So when uh, when he gets a little older, you'll see the eyes start to roll back a little bit, and then you'll oh, no. know that you've accomplished something today. <laughs> <laughs> see, my my kiddo's uh, not not quite four yet. The other one's uh, not quite two, and uh, they're still young enough that they still think I'm funny. Yeah, yeah. And I am going to milk that for all I can right now because that, that changes quickly. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's awesome. Good. Um, gents, this has been a great reminder of everything that prompted me as a small business owner to want to put down stakes here in Milwaukee. And there's just a lot going on here to be excited about. We're just happy to be a part of it here at PodCamp Media. So Milwaukee Common Council President Chevy Johnson, soon to be acting mayor, Matt Dorner, Economic Development Director at Milwaukee Downtown. Thank you for joining us here at PodCamp Media headquarters for this edition of the PodCamp Media Virtual Open House Series. We are a state-of-the-art podcast studio for brands and associations who want to use podcasting to tell their stories. Visit podcampmedia.com slash news to sign up for our email newsletter and get an invite next spring when hopefully we're able to actually do an in-person open house. 
TBD on a lot of the details there, but that's why you got to visit podcampmedia.com slash news to get signed up for that list so we can keep you looped in. But for now, stay tuned to Podcamp Media on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn for more of these virtual open house discussions. And of course, make sure to check out our flagship podcast, Lead Balloon, as well as the great shows that we produce every day on behalf of our clients. Gents, thanks for doing it. Appreciate you. Thanks for having us, Dusty. Absolutely. Thank you for having us.